Uh, my name is Jasper. I'm one of the State of Change team people. Um, uh, this song sort of threw me a little bit. Uh, thanks, James, for, uh, for setting it up. Um, it was certainly a big topic song. Uh, I feel a little bit under, under pressure right now to, uh, to deliver that. Uh, luckily, we do have a big topic, which is creative bureaucracy. Uh, and luckily, we are joined by Charles and Margie uh, to help us explore that, uh, sharing their experiences from uh, both being involved in either founding Creative Bureaucracy, uh, the initiative, or being part of doing research on Creative Bureaucracy uh, and working uh, with Creative Bureaucracies around the world uh, on a city level in, in Margie's case. So we're really happy to, to be joined by, by the two of them to let us into their, um, to their work. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Charles. Uh, he'll, he'll be introducing uh, for 15, 20 minutes. And then from there, we will go into uh, discussion. Uh, you'll hear Margie's reflections. Uh, I'll, I'll kind of make, take stock a little bit, uh, also based on our, some of our work. And then we'll open it up uh, for questions um, and further conversation. So that will be the, the setting. But first of all, over to you, Charles. And thanks so much for joining. and start this presentation it's great to be here with all of you i recognize some of your names um so the creative bureaucracy why what and how well lots of places all around the world are obviously thinking where are we where are we going and i don't need to remind us all of us of the pandemic but i've obviously for many years some of you will know been looking at cities and what they're like how they are interesting or less interesting how they solve their problems these are just covers of some of those initial books how people of difference come together how do we live in relative harmony all of these things and how do we become i suppose prosperous in some broader sense and so on and the summary of all of that in one sentence is simply this creative city harnesses potential and creates the conditions for people to think, plan and act and imagination to solve problems and create opportunities. Now, typically we think then or we thought then at the time that's all about creative artists, creative scientists, creative business people, social innovators, hipsters and all of that to make this happen. But rarely do we think of public administrators, um, you know, are dealing with mobility, welfare, parks, safety, children, and so on. And uh, for me, it was always sort of one of these big blocks, the public administration. It was like something that I could never really enter. I didn't really know what it was about, but felt really the city as an ecosystem can only work if somehow there is a strong link with that administration. I'm going to now overwhelm you by looking at a he from a helicopter view of all the stuff one can see in cities. You know, there are so many types of people, different people with different attitudes and perspectives on life and different religions, all of which some way and somehow have to come together. And then there's, of course, the growing world population, you know, building everywhere. Then the question is, what do we build? Is it going to be ugly? Is it going to be beautiful? Is it going to be fit, uh, the city in which it is? And you can see all of this around the world, some of which is pretty ugly, like the images I'm showing you here. And then again, we all have to eat. And again, I was thinking, well, how do we organize all these markets? Some of them are chaotic, some of them are ordered and so on. And then, of course, how do we move around? What forms of transport have we got? And these are just images from different countries of, you know, buses, trains, etc., etc., etc. And, of course, all of this is happening at ever greater speed as, you know, we connect through a digitizing world and so on. And within that, of course, the other problems that exist, which someone has to deal with or help, is homelessness, poverty, etc., or how to deal with favelas that are on the top of mountains, and how do those people get to work, and so on. And within that, the sort of issues, again, I was thinking about is, you know, everything seems to be the same. We're having all these apparently great hubs, tourism hubs, and so on. 
and all the buses are actually the same buses. And everywhere again, we could ask ourselves, how do you manage, you know, the plethora of advertising signs? You know, this just happens to be one company we all know of, Coca-Cola. And that, within that, how do you protect distinctiveness, that that is local in a homogenizing world. And of course, we all know that many people are reacting against that, you know, from graffiti artists to whatever. And all of it, to some extent, needs to be guided in some sort of way. And within that, that guiding, there are always these pressures from below, like here, the sort of alternative movements, creating different forms of housing and so on. And within that as well, that city that evolves is, can we create interesting public spaces and places? And of course, a lot of all of that is in the end, ends up as rubbish. And what do we do with that? How do we recycle it or make the world sustainable? And how in the end are we anchored in a place where we feel okay? Right. I'm sorry that I did that to you, but the reason I did it was just to show that if we look at things from the helicopter perspective, there's so much to sort out. And now we realise, of course, this complexity, even more so today, that one has to have a sort of plan B that perhaps the old system doesn't work. And the cliche of the public administration, of course, is that it's just all red tape and so on. That may be partly true, but is not necessarily true. And the trigger for us is, has been really, you know, when you look at a public administration, not everybody is stupid. There's so many people, they've decided to join it. They've got positive values. But somehow often, and the issue we were always looking at is how... Do the structures allow people to fully express themselves? Because quite often as people go through the system, you know, their aspirations, their energy fades. And um, one of the issues that really comes up, as it says here, we bring them into these bureaucracies, but we train them to conform. And so they're not fully expressing themselves in terms of what they could offer. So the creative bureaucracy is two strange words put together. It could have been called innovative governance, but it's a provocation. It's basically saying there are administrators out there who are imaginative, who could give more. And it's essentially trying to recapture the positive values of what public administrations are about. And there are sort of three aims, you know, how do you revalue the public good and the common good? How do you shift the image of what a public bureaucracy could be and how, of course, do you attract young people to want to join it and become part of it? The three pillars, you could call it, is really how do you reassess the incentives and regulations regime? How do you reshape the inner life of the bureaucracy? Something that Margie really pointed out to me I hadn't really thought of in the book we jointly wrote. And then how do you create trust to the other worlds, the civic world, and better links with the business world and so on. And the obvious aim ultimately is to create better places to live, to address the global issues that really matter, and to create fairer, more livable cities. And one of the triggers as well is, of course, we all know, and ever so and more now, we're in the midst of a systemic crisis. And to manage that transition to a livable planet requires thinking probably differently. Some would say it's one minute to midnight, but it certainly is urgent when you have these fractures of a world whose economics is materially expansive, which is socially divisive and environmentally hostile. And that requires us to rethink the rules and regulations in a way that is ideally fresh. And many people and entities are considering these issues. There's OECD's OPSI, States of Change, is doing it as we are doing it in this learning festival. There's Apolitical. There are other organizations, all of which I think are great. I suppose what we're trying to focus on is a bit more on the individual, that individual in the system, and how with allies one can change the things for the better. And another sloganistic way of putting it, how can you move from a no because culture to a yes if culture? 
Now, there are three issues I just wanted to highlight, and perhaps I'll pick them up in the discussion. There's creativity of the individual, and we know what that might involve, a bit of openness, thinking in an exploratory way, you know, connecting seemingly dis disconnected things, looking afresh at things, you know, being relaxed about ambiguity. Lots of qualities we associate with individual creativity. However, we're dealing with complex systems, cities or states, and then you've got organizations. So what's the creativity of an organization? You want those individuals in it, but where the most important thing then in an organizational context is the team. How do we work together with mutual respect? How do we balance skill sets? How do we balance people who think in a divergent way or others who are always more focused? You know, how do you deal with the skeptics and the consolidators and those who like implementation? Anyway, so these are some of the issues that one would have to deal with when one's thinking about the organization. And then you've got the city or the system, and there's a different level of complexity. You're trying to bring these different cultures of people, this diversity of organizational entities together. And that's where that whole notion of collaborating and perhaps finding stories and ways of a compelling narrative about the place you're in to harness the individuals and the organizations together and so on. The key word in all of this is probably openness. And then you might ask, well, what is this creative bureaucrat, who, the future bureaucrat? And these are some of the words that come up. They're people who are able to be focused at one hand and then open out, willing to think ahead, uh, emotion and intelligence, the skills that are required are perhaps both generic, but also specific and technical. Obviously, that's all about breaking the silo and so on. And the other thing one should ask or could ask is what type of creativity are we talking about? So, for example, what type of creativity is required today in the context we're in? But if you look at the levels of creativity, often it's great if a place just copies something that someone else has done well or then perhaps modifies it a bit. I don't think there's anything wrong in that at all, but it may be creative in the context it's happening in. Quite often what happens is someone might learn from community development and then link the knowledge from that into some economic uh, development uh, initiative or something. So as you see, these are just different levels. And sometimes you can take an interesting idea from one field, let's say an artistic field, and apply it to a straightforward routine field and see what happens or mix science, art and bureaucratic initiatives together. And very rarely is there something that is completely new, but nevertheless, it's useful to bear that all in mind. And so when you think of planning ahead, the sort of issues I think emerge from that are quite interesting. And I think we all know that when you take this helicopter view, there are lots of initiatives. Any city, any of the cities you represent here have done interesting things. So, but I think some issues we could focus on is how do you create critical mass? The typical thing is someone funds a project that's a bit innovative and then it sort of withers away. So how does one generate that critical mass? How does one scale up ideas and initiatives and approaches from housing to anything else? How does one scale it up so that it moves from the pilot idea to a mainstream idea? And then how does that knowledge, uh, the both technical knowledge, the knowledge that one has in one's mind, the insights and so on, how does that get embedded in a system or is the system so rigid that you can't change it? So one of the big questions is, do you, and I've thought about this for 15 years, do you have to change the structure? And as you know, so many places continually change structures as someone new comes in and so on, or do you change the culture? Now, as you all know, changing the culture is the thing that takes longest, but it is probably ultimately about a mindset in a system 
that creates a culture that is more a culture that is enabling, that is more empowering, particularly to those who are working in it, but also enables them to connect with the knowledge and insights and potential of the outside world rather than operating in an island. And so where next? Where next? That obviously relates partly to the pandemic. And I heard a phrase on the radio station the other day, and it says the hubris has been humbled. And it certainly has been, and I don't need to tell you that you can hear the birds sing and the air's cleaner and all of that. But that asks us, what is the priority for the next wave of imaginative responses? We realize, of course, as many have done, that there's some silver lining to the problem we've got. But it requires then, instead of saying the focus of creativity should be, I don't know, running an arts program, it might be something completely different. Um, although this is a piece of art that a local friend of mine did, he changed lockdown to lockdown every three weeks. He has a new word. Um, and so that's really the question to me. We uh, have a connection, I hope, with the States of Change. We've chatted with you all. And we have our initiative, which is called the Creative Bureaucracy Initiative. And one of our main highlight points is a festival that we've been doing for two years and we're planning for September again and I hope you're involved in and I hope we get the essence of the learning festival as one of the presentations there. So our festival looked like this, we all had these uh, scarves which said we're a creative bureaucrat, whether we are or not it doesn't matter. But you'll see at the end, those who read German, that in the place it took place in Berlin, it said, philosophers has only interpreted the world, now is the time to change it, which is, uh, as you well know, the saying by Karl Marx, and this place we held it in was in the former Eastern Germany. So there we are. That's my little trigger for all of you. I hope there's something that's worth discussing within it. Thanks so much, uh, Charles. That, that was excellent. Um, a lot to uh, dive into. Uh, I'm certainly uh, curious about a number of things. Uh, luckily, we have Margie uh, with us as well, um, who is, well, amongst other things, I'm probably going to be able to share something around the inner in their lives of, of bureaucracy. Uh, but Maggie, over to you in terms of your reflections on, on Charles' presentation. Uh, thanks, Jasper, and thanks for having me to this session. And thanks, Charles, for that presentation. And I think that one of the words that you used is um, you do get a sense of overwhelm. And it's easy at the moment for many of us to feel this sense of overwhelm as we're a kind of at the we don't even know where we are. Are we at the beginning or at the end or at the mid middle of uh, a, a paradigm shift of a crisis of where are we going? And that's incredibly um, challenging for us all to get our heads around. And I apologize for looking down at my notes on this because I did make a few notes because I think what I wanted to do is to grab out of Charles's um, rich, <laughs> complex presentation, this idea, uh, one of the ideas, which is that of the individual bureaucrat, um, as a person who's worked in the bureaucracy for uh, many years, I was always trying to grapple with what was it possible to do? How did things change? Um, how did we manage to, how could we get things done? How did we bring energy into the system? And these things are, are continual challenges in bureaucracies. And one of the things that's always struck me is how much talent is caught up uh, how, when you go around the world, you can see that some of the top people, the top graduates are employed by their bureaucracies. And yet then in a way they're allowed to not, they're not necessarily developed. And they, in fact, are almost the opposite of developed. They're sort of undeveloped in the sense that they start to lose their confidence. They start to lose their sense of, of what they could be contributing. And then they start to join in with saying, well, we need an, external person to come in and help us do this, or we need to employ a consultant to help us do that. 
But the great thing about working in government is that it aligns so strongly with so many people's values. It's a complex and interesting place to work. It should in fact be the most interesting place to be, but in a way somehow the interest of it can be sucked out for people. Um, I've interviewed loads of people about their work in bureaucracy and I've surveyed a few hundred more. And what I've discovered is that so many people really care about their work. They're incredibly passionate about it. They want to be bringing even more. Um, in my survey, 84% wanted to contribute more. Only 38% felt valued. And so we've got this challenge as to how do we bridge what people want to be bringing and offering and what the system allows them to offer. And it feels to me as I've gone along and thought about it more and more, that it, somehow there is a system um, barrier. The system keeps, and when I talk about system, I don't necessarily mean the city, but more the system of government or the system of the organization, somehow prevents people from contributing in the way that they could be. And there's also a different nuance to government creativity, which um, Charles has gone through and described all these different forms of creativity. But a lot of creativity from bureaucrats is actually how they navigate the system, how they get the system to work, how they overcome its dysfunctionality. And as a result of that, in a way, that, that suck of that type of energy tends to distract them from doing other things. It's, it's, not, it's not necessarily using their talents as well as they could. There's also a, a role that managers play creating a context. They may themselves not be seen as creative, but they themselves create a context. Um, I, I, as a practical example of bureaucrats, I have been interviewing people that work in bike infrastructure for the last six months. And one of the things that strikes me is that they're, they're in the middle often of local authorities. They are often uh, passionate about this topic, but often, uh, but they're stymied at every, uh, you know, turn. They are dealing with resistance from the community, resistance from their organisation, resistance from political level, and often it's quite a traumatic role to be doing. At the moment, though, we're in this great moment of revaluing bike infrastructure, so that's happening almost like magically across the world. But what we don't see are all the people that have been plugging away at this topic for years and years and years without any great visibility to us in the innovation space. But I see them as quite uh, creative and innovative. So um, I think the challenge of our moment is that it's, for some people, some bureaucrats, it's like incredibly engaging now. They're being called on to do things in ways they've never been asked to before. It's very almost, um, you know, it's almost exciting to be suddenly thrown in to a crisis and be having to create and invent things. Others are a little bit on the margins and not in the center of things. And in fact, there is a risk of how we think about the energy of the system as it gets a bit fractured across all these people working from home and not really being able to mobilize uh, people. So that, that we're at the standard point of time when some people are doing amazing and interesting things through government and we're having this real revaluing of the, the value of government and we're really seeing how they might be innovating in a city context. And at the other side, we've got probably a lot of people that are quite traumatized and slightly disconnected and yet capable of bringing an awful lot of their own. So I guess these are some of the challenges that I think that, um, that I'm seeing, uh, particularly in the work that I'm doing here. And I'm curious about how we, we leverage these incredibly engaged and people that are inventing completely new ways of working the system, but how we are able to take that forward and what might be necessary for that to happen. That's me finished. <laughs> Thank, thanks, Monty. Uh, that was that was really um, thoughtful and, and a great kind of a line of, of input, uh, both uh, specifically for Charles Walls, but generally. Uh, there's a lot to, to recognize. I'm going to encourage um, uh, people uh, on this call to start feeding in questions in the in the chat. Uh, we're happy to kind of jump on those uh, throughout the conversation. Um, uh, a few a few thoughts uh, on on my end, and and I'll, I'll try to work it into a question. 
uh, maybe you can kick us off then, Charles. But um, we had a session uh, last week uh, on policy entrepreneurship that was very much um, along the lines that you were describing, Maggie, which is which was um, um, which was sort of uh, ended up being a conversation about how these these this role of policy and uh, as a policy entrepreneur could be kind of a tactical. Um, tactical representative of common sense. Um, I suppose, well, why are we not just not doing uh, this particular thing that, that makes sense for all of us? What, what's the hindrance? And what they are spending their, most of their time on is kind of removing barriers and making alliances and, and sort of persuading people or getting people kind of involved in articulating this thing that is the common sense of, of what we need to, do, to be doing um, and there's a big part of that as well that it, that includes people finding or uh, refinding their purpose uh, of why sort of getting back to why they joined uh, the civil service to begin with. Um, I, and but I guess I'm wondering uh, with with that in mind, uh, I guess sort of two things. Um, uh, if we're talking about the, the sort of individuals, uh, the individual creative people in bureaucracy, one is around. Um, what is often to be referred to as, I guess, capacity building, or some in some cases, culture. Um, if um, if a lot of this is about embedding new mindsets, or embedding. Is this a recruitment issue? Um, is this a, a training issue? Is this a learning environment issue in terms of setting up uh, different support mechanisms in government to do that? Um, and, and in what way do we think about uh, the outcomes of that uh, if this is a continuous process? Uh, because uh, this is uh, also drawing in on, on some of our work in Canada and, and elsewhere it seemed to me that, that rather than training people to become more creative, it was about activating a, a part of their personality or part of, um, uh, yeah, something they, again, was part of their human personality, but was did not bring to work that much. So if that's the case, um, how do, you know, how do we, what's the, what's the sort of training program, if any, that can support that? What does that look like? Um, and then the other part of that, which is sort of more related to our current state of affairs uh, around COVID, uh, we're obviously seeing a lot of public servants showing up in really massive and impressive and interesting ways at the moment um, in terms of responding to the crisis, in terms of mobilizing in certain ways. Um, but there's a bigger question, I think, which we've touched a lot upon in this festival as well, which is, you know, is this mobilizing create creatively in terms of going back to normal, going back to where we were, or is it actually shaping something new? Because um, I, I, I do see a lot of public servants being very good at adapting and responding creatively uh, when it comes to, you know, finding our way back to where we were, but actually less so when it comes to shape, uh, the future um, in, a, in a, let's say, um, while we are shaping, let's, let's shape the thing that we actually really want to have uh, kind of sense. Um, so I'm just wondering about those two uh, uh, as maybe a starting point for our conversation. Uh, and then we can um, bring other people in after that. Charles, I don't know if you want to kick us off. to unmute you. Don't have the power to do that, James. Can you help? Oh. Uh, Here we go. Okay, I'm there. Sorry about that. Um, no, that was quite a complicated question there. Um, uh, what, what strikes me is that there's a lot in what you're saying, but I think the basically it's often not lack. The ideas are often not lacking that people might have to solve whatever the problem is. Let's say um, affordability in housing, 
let's say, historically dealing with the Airbnb gentrification problems in new ways that might be different in the future, or any problem that we might address. And the question that we really also need to focus on is, is the question of power. And I thought it was very useful that you were saying, why does that not happen that we know could happen and should happen? And so there is this question of power uh, that is part of it. I uh, think that so far what happens often is the politicians are tending to blame the bureaucrats or anyone else uh, for something that is not, not happening. Now, in relation to the uh, uh, training programme, we are basically arguing, I think, Margie and I, that the context that people are in doesn't allow them to work on all the cylinders they actually have, all, all, the, all the bits of their brain. What I think practically often works, and one can see that, is when someone says, look, here's the system, it's too complicated, let's put out a task force or whatever it is, which then operates by different rules. And then one suddenly finds quite often that people can, 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 can solve the problem because perhaps they don't need to go through the normal procurement processes or, 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 or whatever else. So I think, uh, yes, we can all be more imaginative than we already are. Um, but I think it's the overall context where the individual public servant or someone has got to be allowed to, for example, make a mistake, because most people are not trying to make a mistake. They're, they're um, whatever, they're trying their hardest. And so we're back to that question of creating an environment. And all of these things are then part of it, like uh, your, 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 your training program. The other thing that I found quite interesting. We once did a big session with 250 public servants and they said, well, what would be the simplest way to loosen up a public administration to allow people to come up and solve things better? And they said, just in the recruitment process, have the category called being creative as one of uh, the elements in that. Ditto in the evaluation process that obviously someone has uh, once every year. Um, so, and then there's the final problem that I just want to highlight, is people tend to, in recruitment context, often re reproduce themselves, and that may be a problem. But anyway, over to you, Margie. Um, yes, I, I'm not entirely sure what I'm about to say, but um, I think that... In a way, we have not, uh, you can't say the public sector across the world hasn't tried to reform itself or innovate for decades. There's always been this program or that program. Um, and often what ends up happening is that people get um, caught up in creating a program that's sort of a little bit tangential to what the real world of the bureaucracy actually is. And then they end up trying to solve something that is maybe not exactly the problem. And uh, I think that the, the thing is that people, if you ask people what they, they wish they could do more of in government, it's very simple things. It's like having a conversation that is a conversation versus a meeting or a, having somebody interested in what they've got to offer. And what I've discovered was all these people had ideas that they wanted to they would like to bring into the system and see whether they worked or not, but uh, they felt reluctant and nervous of uh, their managers. Uh, they felt that they didn't really have the relationships that were there. And I feel like there's like a lack of proper conversation and communication in organisations in, in the public sector. So I think that goes beyond training. I don't know that it's about training. I think it's more about people being... Um, a bit inspired and a bit uh, feeling a bit less consciously the levels of other people. And somehow we need to somehow depower this idea of you're the most important person, you're the second most important person to get down to the point where old, I'm not that important and I don't really have any influence. Uh, in terms of going back to the, um, back, 
to us a normal what I'm feeling and this is very weak signal so I and I'm only in one city so I don't know how it's going in other places necessarily but I've got this feeling that there's a great um, energy for trying to not go back to the way that the system was and using this as an opportunity to change and reframe it and the problem that we will always have is that how that happens will always be contested and we pretty and I, it's different in different uh, regi regimes in different countries some countries are quite comfortable with contesting each other and arguing um, uh, so i understand that's true in finland there's quite is quite reasonable to have an argument in a meeting um, whereas in australia it's not as uh, people aren't comfortable with that everybody wants to feel feel like they agree with each other and so there's not really an atmosphere to, for debate so I feel, we, I feel like we need to build up the capabilities of disagreeing and moving on and using that as a, a source of energy. Because fi my final point is I feel like we've got a whole system that is de-energized. And if we could only work out ways of adding in points of energy, like a bit of, uh, what did we do once, Charles? The feng shui, the city, we could feng shui the public sector or we do some acupuncture or whatever it is. But but bringing in energy in a helpful way across the system. Um, it, I don't really know how you'll do that, but it feels like that we've got a system that is somehow sucking out people's energy. Well, I think, I think what's quite, quite interesting, another point that, that could have been mentioned is, is the whole thing about the discretionary effort. When you see an organisation where, uh, where the actual atmosphere is one that feels enabling, you suddenly see the discretionary effort go up. I, when it's five o'clock and you say, can you help me? They say, absolutely fine. Of course, I'll help you in the state till six o'clock. Now, if we look at the potential of the individuals working in these sectors, which by the way, is the biggest sector in the world. I've forgotten how many public servants there are in Europe. I think it's 80 million or something. Uh, if you just think of creating an environment where that discretionary effort would go up by 3%, that's an incredible resource if you wanted to call it a currency. And that's partly what we're talking about. Now, when Margie and I wrote the book, we gave tons of examples of how you could do this, who did what, and what projects are interesting and so on. And some of those have been presented at the Learning Festival. So it's again back to, it's not the ideas, it's the problem. It's the context which enables you to release that that potential that is there and obviously sometimes training will help uh, but often it's giving people the confidence that they can act yeah no appreciate that both of you uh, and maybe just jumping on that that point charles uh picking up richard's question from the chat about uh maybe becoming a little more practical i already kind of heard uh a few things coming out of your comments there Marky, about kind of shifting meetings to conversations and and um, I think someone else in the chat saying well it's not about asking for permission it's about asking for forgiveness and that, that kind of thing but what might be other um, practical concrete behaviors that that we'd like to see uh, sort of um, more of I guess um, and that kind of public servants can come away with from this conversation and say well start doing this instead of what you're usually doing um, I know there's a lot, but maybe just a couple of top uh, that, that's sort of on the top of your list. Um, I could just personally, I could just say that I understand the power that you've already got. I think that um, public servants have a tendency to talk themselves out of their own um, power or influence. And actually, a lot of people have what I think is the most helpful of these powers is convening power. That is, you often you need permission to do this or you need a budget to do that. But, but many people have the power to convene other people in different combinations. And just, the power, just doing that seems to start to build a cohort of, of people around a particular interest or around a particular challenge. Um, and you start to build a, a sense of this critical mass. I think that, that taking the power, understanding the power that you've got and working out how to use it I know that some people do that under the radar. They're more comfortable just saying, well, I'm going to hold on to this idea and I'm going to wait for the circumstances to be good enough for me to take it into the world. 
So that's one way of doing it. But another way of doing it is to say, let's start now and I can do what I can do within the context of my current job. Yeah, I mean, back to that, that thing, uh, there, there are so many examples, let's say the Office of Civic Imagination in Bologna, let's say the net, what European network of living labs, I'm just giving these as random examples uh, of things and initiatives across Europe, I'm mentioning now, but it could be in the wider world, that are trying things, and we're back to that point, is they're often filtered out from the mainstream, um, the main entity, which let's call it the big bureaucracy. And the question, that's why I raised that question of how do you embed, it's not, you can always have these things at the edge, how do you mainstream those different uh, ideas at a quicker pace? That's really uh, the, the question. And what COVID has taught us, I mean, just let's think of the Berlin bureaucracy, renowned as pretty, uh, turgid or whatever, some <laughs> broadly negative word, how they responded giving checks out to people, 20,000, within 48 hours, you know, to, to support them. Uh, so it's all possible. The question is, how do you generate the urgency? And this is where the COVID crisis might be useful because it's generating a potential urgency and there's a level of expectation now that has emerged, which perhaps allows some of the ideas that are there, just like Margie talked about in terms of the bike lane things, they've all been there for 10 years and stuff like that, that they're actually being implemented. Right. Um, maybe just uh, kind of following up on that point, there's another question in the chat, uh, kind of addressing um, your point about convening, Margie, uh, as well. and um whether it's useful to to reframe the role of the public servant and this is uh, again coming both back to our discussion last week about a policy entrepreneur is that a useful term for a particular role of, of a public servant um but this uh, i feel like is is probably a little bit a broader one as well generally should we think differently to, to not just a job description but the, in terms of the role rather than being an administrator Sort of facilitator, which is suggested in the chat, but might there be other, almost like yeah, role, function, role, function descriptions or metaphors that are useful uh, to kind of drive this in another direction. Um, personally, I think that the what we've got is a whole lot of role, unhelpful role descriptions from a previous era, that value things that we don't necessarily have the role descriptions for things that matter now or the types of jobs being valued that matter now. Like there's a huge amount of value created in government and outside by people that just join the dots and actually can see a bigger picture, can see patterns, can get people to want to work together, can cross boundaries. And yet these people are not necessarily um, visible or employed and sometimes it's just because they personally are trying to get something done or they're personally of that type of temperament that they like to talk to people and get people together or to problem solve uh, but i feel like if it would be helpful if somehow we could raise up certain roles that are helpful within the system and when i say we i think i probably mean we need to start Firstly, I feel like we need bureaucrats to become more of themselves and more demanding and more confident. I know this is like a bit like, where do you start? Where, where does confidence come from? But if, if in a sense, that's why the Creative Bureaucracy Initiative is quite an interesting idea because it's trying to, to think that there's possible that we could have a movement um, and movement could mean that bureaucrats are supporting and helping and giving ideas and energy and encouragement to other bureaucrats. And I think sometimes it's hard to find that within an organisation because it's all a bit close, but certainly across organisations and across jurisdictions, we need to be doing much more bureaucrat to bureaucrat, helping and encouraging and connecting those people. Sorry, that feels like a bit of a jumbled response to uh, that. But can, can I pick up that point? Because one of the things we did do uh, an analysis of connectors in South Australia, a part of that, and what we discovered, which I think we all instinctively know, is 
the person who connects well needs to have no power and power simultaneously. In hierarchical structures, the person who is the leading networker, it's all it's a bit defined in, in, in that context, which is sort of top bottom and so on. And the people who are most effective, we discovered were people who were partly visible and not visible because you don't when you're networking a complex group of people and people who can solve a problem in a city you don't you can't say oh i'm in charge i'm the boss of the network or anything like that because everybody will be irritated and what you're trying to do is really bring different parties together to collaborate so this question of because we are in a networked world is this strange paradox the best networkers in a sense don't express and exert their power because if they exert it too much people get a bit pissed off by them because they're too much in the center and this is that is perhaps one of the the the, the main roles which which needs to be taken much more seriously um and so that is a role great and i maybe just shifting um focus uh but but in a sense jumping on on, on that uh, point i think um there's a couple of questions in the chat about uh sort of the uh the stick distinctiveness of city level government here and i know that's been your main focus in terms of your work uh and we've also seen and it's been emphasized a lot with, with the covid response like the 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 city governance in general seems to be um of increasing importance and there's obviously a bigger question about the, whether that's the future of governance more generally like we are becoming more localized and universalized at the same time and so on uh, yeah. but I'm curious yeah. but I, in, in I guess two things one is for the city level um, uh, this this increasing focus on local autonomy are you seeing what are you seeing uh, in terms of trends that is that, that is kind of um, illustrating what is happening around kind of uh, this governance issue. Uh, and secondly, um, is there a distinctive, so when we talk about the individuals in this conversation, are there a big difference uh, when it comes to whether they're working on a city level or a federal level or, or a provincial level? Um, and I'll stop there as a question about politics as well, but maybe I'll, I'll hold that to the end. Well, in the big debate, at the global level, as we all know, there's the issue of state, state versus cities. And the last, uh, you know, UN Habitat uh, Quito declaration was precisely about saying that cities are the places which can uh, deal more effectively with the problems we face. This is all part of the general, if mayors rule the world, Ben Barber type thinking. And within that, there's, for example, the Global Parliament of Mayors, which is precisely making the point you're making. And I think the key distinction we have to make is that between, I suppose, states or the higher level governments often have the authority to create the rule system, if I can put it like that, whereas cities or lower uh, jurisdictions have greater legitimacy in, in a sense, implementing and pushing these things through. So that question between authority and legitimacy is something that rides th through all of that. So perhaps I'll, I'll just hand over to Margie to continue something different or the same. <laughs> <laughs> I would, uh, all I would be thinking is that just having myself talk to people at different levels in um, jurisdictions here in particular, uh, that there is a different quality of relationship to the organization or to the system because when at a city level and of course city governments vary very much in terms of what they are they have authority to do in different places but at a city level there's a more of a direct relationship with with place and with people and with uh, there's more of a sense that you can have an idea and get it done um, even though you have to navigate the uh, the council lures and that sort of politics um so that in some respects that's quite satisfying um on the other hand if you're in a big bureaucracy a big bureaucratic system it you can feel like you're lost within that that's definitely true but then the issues you're often working on are quite system-wide complex issues and that's also incredibly interesting and you can it's an important role to have and it's the 
you hope that you've got people that are engaged in that. But you also find there's a certain more, there's a certain, I feel like in a federal system, in some respects, there's a greater sense of freedom because you're not as visible because there's much more of a tolerance for people going on and thinking and connecting. Anyway, this is just a speculation to some extent, but I, I just, I feel like the experience is different and I think it's helpful for bureaucrats to understand that, to understand that, uh, to not be, because there's also a sense of hierarchy there and that the, the federal person might be considered to be more significant than the local person but actually that's it's really helpful for people to have had the opportunity to work at the different systems that's different levels and understand the different pressures that you have can i just make one point which just came to my mind it doesn't relate to a question one of the biggest ways of um, unleashing the sort of potential to do things and make change is often the the, the classic thing of reframe reframing an issue just like the word transport is now has perhaps become mobility or then movement then that then suddenly if your strategy is about movement moving around and access, you're suddenly bringing many more people into the frame, which is not only the person who specifically knows about cars and trams and things like that. So the reframing, I, I wouldn't call it a trick, but the reframing idea can be powerful in breaking down some of these uh, departmental barriers and, and so on, because then different people from different perspectives can have an ownership of, of, of an issue and contribute to it. Yeah, thank, great, thank you. Um, I really want to ask this question. I'm mindful of time, so I'll, I'll try to do it anyway. We'll, we'll see if we can be quick. Because um, uh, there was mentioned uh, the questions around power and politics uh, in the chat as well. Uh, and one of the things that I've experienced uh, in my work in the Danish government is that um, you can in only get so far when it comes to embedding creativity in government. And I think we did a somewhat good job in some respects. In, 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 but what we found um, at some point, you're gonna hit the wall of saying, well, this is actually a question of the relationship between administration and politics, because obviously politicians are there to envision, at least ideally at least to envision new kind of uh, possibilities for society, whereas the Rutgers is there to respond to that, or at least collaborate around that um so so and there in that point there was a kind of it, it was like a little bit they didn't want to touch that relationship with that, that seemed like a holy agreement that they you know couldn't do anything about so essentially you know we can become as creative as we as we can but but if the politicians are not there to collaborate in, in a new way we're not going to get very far how do you see that and how do you see this role of politics when you're talking about creative bureaucracy. You go, Margie. Uh, I I, um, I think it's a real, really important issue. And I think that, I mean, our prime minister said some last year um, in one presentation to uh, the federal bureaucracy that uh, just remember to your, all of you are public servants. That is, you're here to serve us. Um, and that, is a notion that uh, the political level have that in fact this is a kind of a form of a servant for them not in not a service servant in um, for the for the bigger public good or for the you know for those mm. issues and I think that um, it's caused a lot of anxiety I think we need to revisit and re-examine the, the importance that the administration has that independently to be um, scanning the horizon, to be thinking strategically, to be developing policies and ideas, and that that is a legitimate and important thing that it does because politics is, uh, comes through every three or four or five years as an election and it changes. If somebody has to hold the ring for the longer term, and I think that that's, why, that's a role that the bureaucracy needs to have, obviously not that they are creating their own alternate form of political leadership, but uh, really reclaim a legitimate legitimacy um, in the idea space. So, um, and I really like the way that Jeff Morgan describes 
I don't know the the way that he describes the brain or the um, the intellect, the environment of government. I think that there is something there that we need to get deeper in. Um, so thanks, Charles. No, I'm fine. fine. I'm fine. Or oh, I think I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, appreciated both of you very much. This was an, a great learning experience and very insightful. And obviously we only got so far, there's many more questions as well as more exploration to be done on this topic. But luckily we are, we're all working on it, I guess. Thanks uh, to everyone for joining um, and see you hopefully soon in the, in the festival, particularly thanks to Maggie and, and Charles for, for sharing. Uh, see you next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.